maybe trying to remember how to spell something right off the bat. But, uh, unless you really rehearse it, then it's usually gone in about 20 seconds. And as I said before, there's this continuous transfer from uh, long-term memory uh, to working memory. And that's what makes new information meaningful, is being able to uh, pull up things that you already know and, and attach some meaning to that new information. Um, yeah, it makes sense out of new information. And uh, so studies in children show that poor ability to store material, uh, they fail to progress normally in tasks related to literacy, like reading and writing and most academic areas. So, uh, so when it comes to recommendations, you know, now some of these are pretty simplistic, and some of them relate to school, and some relate to home. But uh, you know, certainly in a classroom, you would want to have, you know, you would want that person sitting near the front of the room if you know that they have working memory deficits, and you'd also want to uh, make sure as much as possible. And most teachers do this, I think, anyway, as they provide some kind of written form of instruction. Although at the junior high and high school level, some of that might diminish. But I just think it's a real good idea to always keep in mind if you have, you're going to have some kids who have working memory or processing speed weaknesses, and they're, and they're just not going to be able to keep up like the other kids do as far as being able to hear something, write it real quickly, you know, hold it, uh, write down something else. And so I think it's, it's good to, as much as possible to provide a written or visual indication of directions too. You know, either written on the whiteboard or blackboard or, uh, or on a PowerPoint. And sometimes it's good too to have, have the student repeat information if it doesn't single them out and make them feel like, whoa, I've got to repeat the directions to make sure I understood them. Uh, and of course, just having external memory aids, like if there's calendars in the room that show when things are due or when certain homework has to be turned in. Teach them how to rely on those other things in the, the room that will help them retain information. Um, so, uh, and of course, in, in classes where you have, where you do lectures or you talk, uh, you know, you talk a lot, you'd like your kids to get in the habit of taking notes. It's, of course, you know, helpful just to provide them with handouts of, the, of what you're discussing. Now, especially at the college, you know, these things can happen at the college level. You know, at the college level, if someone has poor working memory or processing speed, uh, then it's a totally uh, reasonable accommodation to have photocopies of notes. I think increasingly a lot of instructors even put them on the internet or some of their lectures on the internet. But being able to either have a photocopy of the lecture notes or being able to have a, uh, have someone else who's a note taker come in the classroom and that sometimes they hire note takers at college and they come in and take notes and then they give them to the professor and he distributes them to those students who have that accommodation. So that's it's considered totally reasonable accommodation. Um, and of course, whenever you're giving directions, it's always good to Provide directions in multiple formats to show if you're, if you're, especially when you're asking younger kids, it's good to show them that as you're giving the directions, to show them exactly what it is they have to do. To have the workbook or or a sample of the written work up on the board, and here's what you have to do: you have to circle this, you have to underline the correct verb, or so that they can see it as well as just hear it, because the working memory is, you know, it helps them compensate. Um, and of course, using yes, visual aids, concrete materials, and uh, also it's good to help them model. It's good to teach them how to model visualization techniques and ask them to to you know even close their eyes and imagine what it is they have to do. And that often helps them hold on to it better. Um, you know, other things it's it, it's helpful to teach uh, students to do is to certainly it's helpful to teach them to paraphrase and for them to teach them to read passages and then go back and uh, or read a short paragraph and then ask them to put it in their own words. Often they can, they retain that information better even if they're just speaking aloud in their room. Uh, it 
helps them summarize, and by putting it in their own words, then it's more meaningful to them. Um, and of course, it's, you know, it's really important to overlearn information. Uh, and I talked about this earlier, learning basic information to, to automatic levels. By that I mean, even though it's really hard to do with some kids, and that's like mathematical facts, even though it seems like a really mindless, you know, mindless, simplistic thing to do, if you have automatic math facts, that's going to make problem solving so much easier and so much more accurate. Um, I know there's a lot of games and uh, electronic devices where you can set the timer and then try to solve math facts and there's flashcards and there's lots of uh, things on the, you know, there's lots of electronic and computer-based tasks you can do, but really I think it's really good to start it early to teach math facts because it's going to help bypass in the future problem solving because once they get into high school, even high school, if they don't have those math facts automatically, then they're, it's going to slow them way down. And uh, of course, I have seen kids who've been practicing math facts for years, and they're still pretty sluggish. But still, it's a, I think it's a, I think it's a good, important thing to try to do. Um, and of course, you know, that's when you think about it. You know, working memory. A lot of kids who have learning disorders or ADHD have uh, working memory deficits and that includes kids who have dyslexia and so that's why it's good for them to have a reading approach uh, a dyslexic kid to have a reading approach that provides lots of repetition and lots of review and going over and over and using visual and auditory and um, you know tactile all different modalities because that helps them retain it more successfully. So drill and practice should be a part of everyday classroom activities. I don't know, I remember uh, years ago, in, I, I think I was in third or fourth grade, now some of you, most of you, would probably not remember those golden records. You ever hear of the little golden records? See, you're also most of you are so young. But anyway, those, we would put one of those on and it would just sing, you know, the sixes. Six times one is six. And, it, and we would just sit there in the classroom and just listen. And then we'd have worksheets that we'd do after we listened to the record. So I guess we were getting um, daily practice, drill and practice. And so it's, I think it's really good to practice in the areas of basic facts, um, vocabulary terms related to a specific area. Just practice them until they become automatic. And spelling rules, phonic rules, and those, having those things automatically, or just being able to, to so you don't have to search for them, uh, or you don't know them. It's much better to have those things under your belt, and that will help ease some of the problems that working memory can cause. Uh, and, as in problems in math and producing a written response or reading things you have to do if you're a kid in school almost every day. So it's about teaching, it's about automaticity, just becoming very quick and uh, just so you don't have to think about it. Uh, and you know, beyond that, you know, whenever you get into higher level skills like junior high school level or late elementary, then you want to teach them pre-reading strategies such as uh, relating a new topic to what's been learned, um, of course asking questions, creating a chart, what do you know on one side, and write facts that were learned after reading the assignment, um, and of course teaching book structure that may help you know, retain information more successfully, knowing that you, know, you can rely on chapter headings and uh, read summaries before you start to read the actual chapter and of course the keywords and then I think it's really important for kids who have working memory and I put this in my reports all the time to uh, have active reading strategies and that can be something like completing worksheets or answering questions but I think it's real good if kids can learn to type and then as they read and I do this all the time when I'm trying to you know learn how to score a difficult test. I just sit down at the computer with the manual and I just type in main ideas or phrases.
and then I photocopy that, and then I stick that in the first page of the manual for the test. So the next time I have to administer that test, I can just look at that sheet instead of reading through the manual. So I think if you, if you have, if your kid has pretty good typing skills, I think it's good for them to, uh, you know, have an easel that will hold their book open, and as they're reading, just type in main ideas, important vocabulary terms, and then when they're done, they can just print that out and uh, there's their